everybody. Welcome back to Measure Theoretic Probability. In the last video, we were talking about extending a probability measure from some collection of subsets of an omega to a larger collection. And in particular, we were talking about starting with a field, so that was our collection of subsets of omega, and extending a probability measure defined on those sets to the sigma field generated by that field. So we had a non-empty set omega, we had a field that we were calling F0. We used this big curly F to denote the sigma field generated by F0. We had a probability measure P, which takes in sets from the field and gives us numbers. And we are ultimately trying to define that probability measure for sets in the bigger sigma field. However, what we've started doing so far has not even considered that bigger sigma field. We have just been looking at some subsets of omega, whether they're in the field, sigma field, or neither. So if you take any A subset of omega, our idea, since probability has been defined only for sets in the field F0, was to cover this set with a collection of sets from F0. So in this particular picture, this is an idea of covering the set A, and I'm assuming that these six sets that I've covered it with are all in F0, so I've defined the probability measure for all of these. And if I add the probability measure for all six of these sets, that might be one idea about how to define a probability measure for the set A, but clearly it will be too large for many reasons. One, we have this region, this stuff out here outside of A. Two, we've got some overlap in these sets, so we're double counting some stuff. And um, you might want to talk about the probability measure of the union of these sets, but sometimes it will take a possibly infinite and countable collection of sets to cover a set A, and that's not necessarily in the field F0. And we can only work with sets that are in the field F0. So uh, why not use disjoint sets? If we had disjoint sets, we might actually have a larger overall area. So here's a picture with two disjoint sets, presumably from F0 covering A. And so if these two disjoint sets are from F0, then we have defined P for both of these. So we can add the probability measure of both of these sets as an estimate for the probability of measure of A, but you can see we've got a lot of extra stuff here. So maybe we want them disjoint, Maybe we don't, but we're going to consider all possible collections of sets from F0 that cover A and the total probability of adding all the individual probability measures of those sets. And we want to find a sequence that makes this as small as possible. So disjoint sequences are also included among the sequences we're looking at, as well as um, single sets. You know, another idea might be to cover A with a single set from F0 and estimate the probability measure of A with the probability measure of that single set and look at all possible single sets until you get the smallest one. But single sets and disjoint sets, they're all included in what was our more general definition of an outer measure. So we call this thing an outer measure. I'm about to remind you of what it is, but that's because we're coming at the probability measure from the outside of the set A. You can imagine defining an inner measure where you maybe start with sets that are contained within A and try to get the maximum probability measure that's still um, consisting of sets that are only contained within A. That's another, that's another way to go. But in this video, we're talking about outer measures and we're calling our outer measure P star. So for any subset A and omega, P star of A is defined to be the infimum, which is essentially a minimum, of the sum of the individual probability measures of sets A n, where the A n's come from F naught, which is good because that's where P is defined, and the A n's cover the set A in the sense that A is contained in the union of the A n's. I am using some leading terminology here by calling this an outer measure because honestly, I don't know if this is a measure at this point, and if it is, whether it's a probability measure. Now, you don't you don't really talk about a measure until you have a measurable space, and that consists of a non-empty set omega and some sigma field F on the set. Um, but there are many sigma fields we can define on a non-empty set omega. So is this a probability measure? And if so, with respect to what sigma field? I'm hoping it's going to be the F, the sigma field 
that is generated by the original field F naught, but we'll see. Now, not only do we want to extend the probability measure, which right now is only defined to take in sets in F naught, but we want to not disturb those probabilities. This is why we call this an extension of the measure, because whatever our new probability measure P star is, if we actually plug in a set that's already in F naught, that already is measured by the probability function P, and we want that to stay the same. So we want P star of A, our new measure, to equal P of A, the old probability measure, if A is already in F naught where that old probability measure is defined. So when I say extend the measure, I mean like preserve it where it is and also define it for bigger sets outside of F naught. Now, so far we have proven that P star of A is less than or equal to P of A when A is an F naught. And in fact, we want this to be equal and uh, we don't know that it's not. We just proved kind of half of the equality. If we can also show that P star of A is greater than or equal to P of A, then we will have equality between these things. But we have already shown this one. And let me remind you of all the other things we've shown. So we showed that P star of the empty set is zero, and that's a great thing because that's one of three properties we need for P star to be a probability measure. The other one is we need it to be countably additive, which means that if you have a, a union of disjoint sets, possibly an infinite but countable union, the probability measure of that countable union needs to be the sum of the individual measures as long as they're disjoint. So we need P star of the empty set to be zero. We need that countable additivity. And we do need P star uh, to be between zero and one with P star measuring the entire omega as one. So those are the three to four things, depending on where you want to break those sentences, we need from P star. But right now we know that P star of the empty set is zero, so we're on our way. We also showed last time that for any subsets A and B and omega, where A is a subset of B, P star of A is less than or equal to P star of B. And that was a consequence of having a measure. When we first defined measures, this was something that's true of all measures. It's true of what we've defined here, but it's not enough to tell us that we have a measure. So again, this is just recapping a list of things we know. Uh, we also know that if A is in F naught, I, I already reminded you of this on the previous slide, that P star of A is less than or equal to P of A. And we do want equality here, but we've got at least half of it. And finally, the fourth thing that we showed in the last video is countable subadditivity. So if we have any sets, A1, A2, et cetera, subsets of omega, for countable additivity, you need to look at disjoint sets, but for countable subadditivity, you do not. So A1, A2, A3, et cetera, subsets of omega, the P star measure of the union of these sets is less than or equal to the sum of the P star measure of the individual sets. This is something we showed in the last video, and it's not something uh, that's going to help us prove that we have a measure. So any measure does have this countable subadditivity property, but again, we need to show that P star of the empty set is zero, got that. We need to show countable additivity, which is a statement much like this, but with disjoint sets and with equality. And we need P star of the full omega to be one. We're actually going to go about this in a kind of roundabout way. So for a probability measure P on some space, um, if you have any two sets A and B in the sigma field that you define the probability measure on, we can say that the probability measure of B can be written as a sum of the probability measure of these disjoint sets, some A intersected with B and the complement of A intersected with B. So basically we're breaking B up into two disjoint sets based on what it shares with some other set A and what it does not share with that set A. This is something that holds for probability measures. And again, we're trying to show that P star is a probability measure. If we can show that this holds, that's not quite what we want. This is a consequence of being a probability measure. But is it enough to say that if this holds with P star in place of P, that we have a probability measure? Maybe, maybe not. Let's see what we can do with this. 
The question before us now is, do we have this relationship if we use P star in place of P? I'm going to assume we don't, and in fact, we don't. But let's assume that we don't. I am going to define a new collection of sets to be the collection of sets for which this will hold. So a collection of sets, we use a capital kind of script letter, and I'm going to use this kind of capital script curly M to denote the collection of subsets of omega, so the A's subsets of omega, for which P star of A intersect B plus P star of A complement intersect B is equal to P star of B for all B subsets of omega. If P star is a probability measure, this is always going to hold, but it's not depending on what part of the space you're looking at and what sigma field you're using. So right now, I just want to sort of restrict our attention to sets for which this holds. And I'm going to call this collection M. The good news is that we have part of this inequality already. Um, by countable subadditivity of P star, we do know that P star of any set B so I can write that set B as a disjoint union of the part of B intersected with some other set A and the part of B intersected with the complement of A. And so these two sets happen to be disjoint, but it's kind of irrelevant for what I want to claim because I don't know that P star is countably additive, but I do know it's countably subadditive, and that did not need disjointness. But that does say that P star of a union is less than or equal to the sum of the individual P stars. So you see here that I've got P star of B is less than or equal to a sum that looks like this, and that's always true. So if I want to show that um, some sets A satisfy this with equality, and I know it's always true when I have this as a greater than or equal to, then really I only need to show it when this is actually a less than or equal to symbol. In other words, there is an equivalent alternate way of defining M. I can define M as the collection of all subsets A of omega, such that this P star of A intersect B plus P star of A complement intersect B is actually, got to get this the right way now, less than or equal to P star of B for all B subsets of omega. I think both of these definitions are useful, so I'm going to hang on to both of them. They are equivalent, though, because we do have the reverse inequality always by countable subadditivity of P star. Now would be a good time for the disclaimer of this video. The proof of what we're ultimately trying to prove, which is that P star is a probability measure that extends P from F naught to F, is very long. And I am afraid that we're going to lose the forest for the trees. You know, it, it will probably take three videos. And by the time we reach the end of that third video, you won't even remember what we were originally out to show. So what I'm going to do in this video is outline the plan. And I'm going to state a series of lemmas. A lemma is just a theorem, but usually one that's used to support another result and is not exactly the result of interest. So I'm going to state a series of lemmas. And then at the end of the video, we're going to conclude that if all of these lemmas are true, we do have what we want. And then in the next video and possibly the next two videos, I'm going to prove the lemmas. But if you're not interested in watching those proofs, and I don't know who wouldn't be, I think they're, they're fun proofs and good practice for analysis type proofs, um, I will put in the description box below the next video where new topics pick up again. And by the way, the next new topic is going to be about limit sets. So the limit infimum and limit supremum of sequences of sets. You don't want to miss that, but you may want to miss a couple of videos between now and then. So it's up to you. Now, when you're watching this video, if there's nothing in the description box, that's because I don't know where I am yet because I'm filming as I'm posting. So I assume it's going to take two more videos before I get back around uh, to new stuff, but I will come back here and let you know. So lemma one. We're going to prove that this set curly M is a field. So that's three things we have to show there, and that's going to be pretty routine. Lemma two, we're going to show that countable additivity holds with the measure P star for sets in M. 
So far, we have countable subadditivity for all subsets of omega, and that is a weaker statement with an inequality and not necessarily disjoint sets. But we're going to get the stronger result of countable additivity using the P star measure on the collection of sets in M. We're then going to put these together to conclude that M is a sigma field. And it's not entirely obvious here because we will have a field. And so we'll need to add to that the fact that M to be a sigma field is closed under countable unions, not necessarily finite unions. And that really has nothing to do with the measure P star. So that's not really a consequence of lemma two, but lemma two will help us prove lemma three. So we're gonna need lemmas one and two to prove lemma three. Once we have that, we're gonna go on to lemma four. And that is, we're going to prove that F naught, our original field, is contained in this space M. So that's gonna tell us that we do know for all of the sets in the field F naught, where we already have defined a probability measure, we do have the that defining characteristic of being an M, that P star of A intersect B plus P star of A complement intersect B is equal to P star of B for all A in F naught and for all subsets B in omega. For our fifth lemma, we're finally going to prove that P star is in fact the same thing as P for sets in F naught. And in lemma six, we're going to prove that P star is in fact a probability measure on the sigma field curly M. Now, what does it have to do with the sigma field we actually care about? Curly F, which is the sigma field generated by the field F naught. Here's how we put this together. These lemmas tell us that the sigma field F is sandwiched between the field F naught and the sigma field M. So why is this? We have M is a sigma field. We will have proven lemma four, I think, I've already forgotten, that F naught is contained in M. So if this is another collection and it's a field contained in M, then remember how F is defined. It is defined to be the smallest sigma field that contains F naught, that contains all the sets in F naught. And we've already seen this exact kind of picture. If you suppose that we have a sigma field that contains F naught, that is at least in a picture in area, heuristically, smaller than M, it can't go outside of M like this. We know it can't because we proved that the intersection of sigma fields is a sigma field. So if F, the smallest sigma field containing F naught, goes outside of M, then this intersection of F and M, which are both sigma fields, is again a sigma field that contains F naught, and that contradicts the fact that F is the smallest sigma field containing F naught. So we have now just reproven that if you have a field contained in a sigma field, then the sigma field generated by the field must be sandwiched between them. Another important thing that the lemmas give us is that P star is a probability measure on F that agrees with P on F naught. We will already have shown that P star agrees with P on F naught as one of our individual lemmas. And the fact that P star is a probability measure on the sigma field M and that the sigma field F is contained within M means that P star is a probability measure on the smaller sigma field. And there would be a few things to check here. One is that um, the, the smaller sigma field necessarily contains the empty set and P star of the empty set is zero. Um, the next is that if you take a countable collection of sets in F, the union is then in F because F is a sigma field. And we already have shown or will have shown that P star of that countable union, if they're disjoint, is equal to the sum of the individual P stars. So we have countable additivity using a P star, but only picking sets out of F. And finally, F being a sigma field has to contain the full omega and F naught contains the full omega. And so P star of omega, because omega is an F naught and an F, but specifically because it's an F naught, P star of omega is P of omega. And because P is a probability measure, then P of omega is one. So P star being a probability measure on a sigma field M 
means that it's going to be a probability measure on any sub sigma field. And that's what we wanted. And again, it will agree with P for sets on F naught. And that's why we call it an extension of that probability measure. So we're going to prove probably lemmas one through three in the next video and lemmas four through six and the one after that, and then get back around to new stuff. Uh, but before we go, I do want to talk about how this extension is unique in a certain sense. We have an F naught. We have a larger collection F. We had a probability measure P. We extended it to a probability measure P star. And if you have another probability measure on the bigger space, so let's say Q on F, if it agrees with P on the smaller set, then it agrees with the full probability measure P star on the larger set. And this holds for any set A. So in other words, Q of A is going to equal P star of A for every A subset of F. Again, P star is a probability measure on the larger space F. Q is assumed to be another probability measure on the larger space F. P star agrees with P on F naught. If Q also agrees with P on F naught, then Q is going to agree with P star on the larger set. And um, let's, let's prove this. Actually, it's not going to be very hard. I think we could do this in one slide. So take any set A in the sigma field F. Now, P star of A is the infimum of the sum of P of A n, where A n come from F naught and cover the set A. We did assume that Q agrees with P for sets in F naught. So this is identical to the infimum of the sum of the Qs of the A Ns, where the A Ns are in F naught and cover A. By countable subadditivity of a probability measure, and Q is assumed to be a probability measure, if we take the Q measure of the union, that is going to be something smaller than adding up the individual Q measures of the individual sets in the union where we potentially are adding up too much overlap. So if the sum of the Qs of the ANs is greater than or equal to Q of the union, then all I'm doing between this line and this line is trading this number out for something smaller. So the whole thing is going to be less than or equal to the previous line. But remember, this union of the ANs covers A. And for any probability measure, Q, or whatever you want to call it, if you have a set A that is a subset of a set B, then Q of A is less than or equal to Q of B. Here we have a set A that is a subset of this union. So Q of A is less than or equal to Q of this union. And therefore, if you are comparing these numbers, this number is always smaller than this number. So if you look at the infimum of these numbers, it's going to be less than or equal to the infimum of these numbers. But now I'm looking at the minimum of something that is constant and not changing in, um, like this infimum has taken over all collections of sets that cover A. And this is a fixed number. What is the minimum of the number five when taken over all sets that do this other thing? It's always just equal to five. So this is going to equal Q of A. The infimum is no longer important. It's like, again, someone saying, what is the minimum of the number five when we restrict ourselves to stuff happening? It's always just five. And so we've shown half of what we want to show. What we want to show right now is that Q of A is equal to P star of A for any A and F naught. And we have an inequality saying that Q of A is less than or equal to P star of A. So you know I've got an on the other hand coming. Suppose that A is a set in the sigma field F, then we do know that A complement is in F because F is a sigma field. And so from the previous slide, we showed that P star of A is greater than or equal to Q of A for any A and F. Well, A complement being in F means we can say from the previous slide that P star of A complement is greater than or equal to Q of A complement. Both of these are probability measures on F, so P star of A complement is the same thing as one minus P star of A and Q of A complement is one minus Q of A. Moving things around, this implies that P star of A is in fact less than or equal to Q of A because one minus P star is the larger one. That means the P star of A is the smaller one. 
And this is the opposite of what we showed on the previous slide, where we showed that P star of A is greater than or equal to Q of A. We've now shown that it's less than or equal to Q of A for any A and F. Therefore, we can conclude that P star of A is equal to Q of A, and the result is proven. There's actually a stronger result that we can get. The proof will be different because our proof was dependent on our infimum definition of P star. But in fact, if you have a field F naught, and then a sigma field F generated by F naught, and you have two probability measures called P1 and P2 on F. If P1 of A equals P2 of A for all A in F naught, they're going to have to be equal for all A in F. So this has nothing to do with our outer measure definition. This is true for any two probability measures on a sigma field. If the probability measures again are equal, when you plug in sets on the underlying field, then they're going to be equal uh, for when you plug in any sets on the bigger sigma field. And I'm not going to prove this one. It's not that we can't, but um, I do want to kind of move on. You can find a proof of this in Patrick Billingsley's uh, book, Probability and Measure. It's my all-time favorite uh, kind of Bible of measure theoretic probability. It's kind of intense book. I'm not sure I would take it as my first book for learning about measure theoretic probability, but it's it's something I always want on my shelf to reference. And um, I would give you the theorem number, but I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure because of the different editions. So I think it's maybe in chapter three. And I also think that you're not going to see uh, a field in the statement of the theorem, but something known as a pi system. A pi system is a collection of sets with some properties that that uh, the properties are weaker than that of a field. And we will eventually talk about pi systems in this course. So I think that's all we're going to do for today. It's a little bit short, but uh, in the next two videos, I will prove those six lemmas if you're interested. Otherwise, come back for the one after that, and we'll start to talk about the limb soup and limb inf of sequences of sets. So I will see you in the next one or the one after that, or maybe the one after that.